All right, so here's the review for the chapters on abnormal psych and treatment. Again, I have them broken down by days and subjects that we covered. All right, first of all, we looked at the criteria for having a mental illness, um, the three Ds. So in order to be diagnosed with a mental illness, um, first of all, the behavior has to be distressful. So it has to cause the person distress. It has to cause the person to feel anxious and nervous. You have to give me a second here. Wait a minute. All right. Sorry, somebody was asking me a question. Okay, so first of all, the behavior has to be um, disturbing. So it has to be unusual. Um, it has to be abnormal. It has to be distressful cause the person a lot of stress and anxiety. So if those two symptoms are present, we would say that the disorder is neurotic. So that is when somebody has a mental illness, has a problem, but they know they have the problem. The third D is dysfunctional. And that is when uh, the person loses touch with reality and they're no longer to care for themselves. Their reality is much different than ours. So schizophrenia would be an example there. So if that, all three of those are present with dysfunctional, then the disorder is categorized as a psychotic disorder. All right, so disturbing, distrustful, and dysfunctional. Um, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, that is the uh, book that contains all of the mental illnesses. In the DSM, you will find, and we're in edition five now, you will find a description of the mental illness with the symptoms and also the prevalence. And I give you the example of schizophrenia affects uh, one in every hundred, so 1% of the population. So you don't see cause or treatment because the cause for everyone is different. Therefore, the treatment will be different. Um, the medical model, that was Philippe Pinnell's idea to take the people out of these barbaric prisons and actually try and treat them, talk to them, take them out of the chains and try to help them and maybe cure them of their mental illness. And this began in France. Um, during the Middle Ages, one explanation for irrational behavior um, was the fact that they thought people uh, were demon-possessed or had evil spirits in them. Since uh, everybody was uh, very, very religious during the Middle Ages, religion was, you know, you were required to go to church, and the people were illiterate during the Dark and Middle Ages. Um, so the only way to explain irrational behavior was evil spirits. So historians believe that a lot of priests that were called to exercise demons from individuals were just simply people um, who had a mental illness. All right. Jump ahead here. All right. So here we are looking at... Um, anxiety and anxiety disorders and mood disorders. So generalized anxiety disorder, this is when somebody feels anxious all the time. It never stops. They always, it's a chronic anxiety. They're always feeling anxious. They're always feeling that distress. Um, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, Okay, that is when someone has obsessive thoughts like dirt and germs that causes anxiety. So to get rid of the anxiety, they perform compulsions or rituals like hand washing. And then the anxiety will briefly go away, but it's very cyclical. It comes right back. So the process starts all over again. Panic attack. I don't know why there's commas between these, but uh, panic attack. This is 
a very acute or sudden form of anxiety, um, which can come on without warning. Sometimes it's in response to a stressful situation and they affect everybody different. Some have brief periods of anxiety, uh, like maybe once a year, some people have them on a regular basis and they tend to fade as we get older and more prevalent among females. PTSD, we know the cause of this. Other anxiety disorders, we're unsure of the cause. Uh, we know that PTSD in most cases stems from some traumatic event. Um, most commonly, uh, we associate that with people who have been in combat. So they have anxiety when they think about, they have flashbacks about the traumatic event or nightmares. Uh, phobia is an irrational fear that is persistent. So if you fear something, it's always on your mind, not just when you're around it. Um, specified phobia, we talked about agoraphobia. We talked about agoraphobia is the fear of going outdoors, or going out of your house. A lot of times that is a result of social phobia. So you don't like going out into social settings. You fear interacting with crowds or groups. Um, and eventually that can lead to agoraphobia, just not going out at all, becoming very reclusive. Um, major depressive, so those are all the anxiety disorders that you'll need to know. Um, major depressive disorder, of course, that is feeling like everything is worthless and hopeless and extremely sad and oftentimes lethargic. Um, the main symptom is they lose interest in things that once uh, gave them pleasure. Bipolar, this is when people experience periods of depression, but then also periods of mania where they feel very manic and energized. So they, they have those constant shifts. Antisocial personality. Again, you would think antisocial means people don't want to go out, but actually these are individuals that lack any compassion, any care for others. They can harm other people and they have no empathy whatsoever. They feel nothing for individuals. Sociopaths and psychopaths would be examples of an antisocial personality. All right, we looked at schizophrenia. So the symptoms you'll need to know, most schizophrenics suffer from paranoid schizophrenia and the most common symptoms are delusions and hallucinations. So delusions are the false storyline um, and they're often think that somebody's after them, you know, to persecute them like the FBI is after them, aliens are after them. You know, so I gave you a few examples and stories that I encountered in class. Um, hallucinations, most people who have delusions are seeing people and hearing them talk uh, as a part of the story that's going on in their mind. Some people just specifically hear voices, so they would just have auditory hallucinations. So hallucinations, seeing, hearing things that aren't there. Uh, catatonia, as you recall, that's being frozen in some specific position. Rare, only affects about 1% to 2% of all schizophrenics. I only ever saw one case of catatonia. Okay, causes. Um, research is ongoing, trying to look at, discover a gene. We do know that it tends to run in families and in twin studies show if one uh, twin has schizophrenia, there's a high probability that the other one will as well. Um, but one of the most solid findings is the fact that a lot of people who have schizophrenia, when they were in the mother's, their mother's womb, the mother had a high fever associated with the virus during the second trimester when the nervous system was developing. So they believe somehow that's interfering with the brain development. So mid-pregnancy virus. Sorry, I didn't fast forward that. You guys can pause it and back it up. All right. So that brings me to treatment that we covered the last two days. Free association, you should know well. 
that was a technique that Freud came up with. You say whatever comes to mind and the psychoanalyst will write everything down and then tell you what's going on with you, what's causing your problems unconsciously. So very judgmental. Um, systematic desensitization. This is a form of exposure therapy that is used to treat phobias. And you are treating the phobia by exposing them to what they're afraid of. With systematic desensitization, you're doing it in small steps, building up, and also providing you know, relaxing atmosphere to help reduce the anxiety. So maybe soft music or something that calms the patient down. Um, electroconvulsive therapy. Of course, that is administering electric current through the body to try and rewire the neural connections. Then the impulses that travel through your nervous system are electrical. So if you're acting irrational, the thought is let's give someone an electric jolt and that may rewire the circuitry and change the person's thoughts, thus changing the behavior. Aversive means unpleasant. So this is adding something unpleasant to stop a behavior. So I gave you the example of uh, if your child is sucking on a pacifier and you need them to stop because they have to go to school and can't take it. If you dip that in like mustard or something that the child doesn't like, you're adding something unpleasant. They keep putting that in their mouth with that mustard on it. And eventually they make a connection between the two and stop using it. So adding something unpleasant to stop a behavior. Lithium. Lithium is a mood stabilizer that we use to treat bipolar disorder. Client-centered therapy involves active listening. So this is completely non-judgmental, like free association. This is when you just listen to what the person is saying. You rephrase it in your own words, say it back to the client or the patient. They become aware of their problems and their issues, and they work through it on their own. Um, cognitive therapy, that is kind of like education therapy. You're trying to change somebody's irrational thoughts and therefore that will change their behavior. So cognition is thoughts. Tardive dyskinesia is a side effect of antipsychotic and um, antidepressant medications. It causes the person to have tremors or uncontrolled body movements. One last thing, um, dissociative identity disorder, that's multiple personalities that we talked about. So what's happening is it's, it's usually from abuse as a child. So while a child is being abused, they dissociate, they start to channel their thoughts away from what's happening to help them cope. So they start pretending that there's someone else somewhere else and that develops into the personality. The more severe the abuse and the longer it goes on, the more personalities that will develop. All right, hope that helps. I hope everybody has a fantastic holiday. This quiz will take place on January 3rd. Again, have a great holiday and I'll see you all next year.